Samantha Bryan, otherwise known as Brain, has been making people smile for over 20 years. And tonight, in her first online interview, she welcomes us behind the scenes of her fairy world for an evening that promises, just like her fairies, to delight and amuse. There's something about fairies that hold a specific magic power that captures many people's attention. And as a mixed media artist dedicating her career to fairy making and invention, Samantha Bryan is that creator of magic. Through illustration and sculpture, she aims to give us a glimpse into a magical world. And in her words, the objective of her work is to realise the necessities and requirements that would be involved in fairy life, to provide everything a fairy would demand during its daily existence. And because of this, much of her day is spent preoccupied with everyday life, but not her own. It's that of the fairy. They are adorned with items from her extensive collections of buttons, spotted feathers, seed pods, dyed feathers and contraptions. She combines these materials and found objects to inform their intriguing personalities. Inspired by Victorian era inventions and her desire to be a pilot, her humorous yet industrious creatures are collected worldwide, with collectors reported to have coveted them for 10 years. So how do you balance the demand of raising a young family, creating a species of fairies, pioneering new inventions to improve their fairy life and finding them new homes around the world, all whilst running a business? Well, we're about to find out, and more, including how she keeps motivated to keep creating after 20 years. So let's indulge in an hour of nostalgia, light-hearted humour and fairy delights. From West Yorkshire in England, please help me give Samantha Bryan a warm welcome as our 98th Friday Feature Artist. Hello, Samantha. Hi. <laughs> and hello, everyone. Thanks for waiting and being patient. We had some fairy glitches in the background, didn't we? <laughs> Definitely. They were being mischievous. <laughs> yeah. And we were just saying it's, yeah, it's the internet gods playing tricks because um, I made a comment on your Instagram post saying, let's hope the internet technical glitches, you know, the internet fairies are kind to us. But they weren't those little buggers <laughs> no they were not <laughs> well everyone thanks so much for being so patient it's lovely to be back in the hot seat tonight with you samantha um we've got people from all over the world eva's here from sweden tanya is from brunswick in melbourne hello tanya lovely to see you um denise hello oh, oh, gosh. oh, oh wow yes yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Um, Patricia, hello, lovely to see you. Wendy, we've got Beatty, hello. Jeannie Marie, hello. Gosh, so many people. I am going to keep going. Samantha. Hello, Sarah. Hey, Noni. Hey, Sarah. Gisela, hello. <laughs> oh, oh so from everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so exciting, so exciting. So I hope this is a lovely experience for you, Samantha, and we really are honoured to to be able to ask you lots of questions. So I, I encourage people, this is your opportunity to ask Samantha. I've got about four pages worth of questions here, but if oh, you God. ask a question, I will get to it and I know we'll, we'll move quickly, so don't worry. <laughs> Um, Emma says she's been following this amazing, amazing lady from Italy for quite a while. She brightens up my days. Yes. Oh, yeah. Super. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. So I want to say they say that magicians never sort of give away their tricks or they tell their secrets. Mm -hmm. Is it the same for fairy makers? No. <laughs> no. It's, no, I can give them. Well, yeah, mostly I can give away my tricks. I've always taught them things and, and taught people how to make characters and things like that. So, yeah, it's nice yeah. to share. Fantastic. <laughs> so, everyone, ask away. Samantha's an open book and um, I hear you're a wonderful teacher. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've not had very much sleep, though, so my brain might not be very uh, on fire today. <laughs> That's okay. We'll be kind and gentle, don't worry. <laughs> so I think it's always nice 
to talk about the beginnings, you know, how you started. And, and I've written a, a bit of a heading here saying humble beginnings. Um, and I wanted to ask you about nostalgia. And for me, nostalgia and the word nan are kind of synonymous with each other. So I wanted to ask you about your nan and how she maybe influenced your fairy life. <laughs> Yes, um, so we moved in with my nan, my mum and I, um, I think I was about four um, and she used to, I, I did sleep with my nan for quite a long time and she used to tell me stories when we were going to sleep um, and she also used to put my hair in um, where you do it with rags, the name's gone out of my head typically. Um, yeah. and my nan's always had an awful memory she's she's 90 this year is my nan and, and, and going strong um but she's always had an awful memory and a big family so she goes through tons of names before she gets to your name um and she was always the same with stories um and we spent a lot of time in the park and she would tell me tales about the the creatures that lived in the pond in the park and things like that and i'd get really fixated on a particular story but then when i wanted to, to repeat it the next night she couldn't remember it, so it ended up being quite a collaborative process telling these stories. And what about this character? And you've forgotten such and such. And and so yeah, story storytelling, um, and and sort of imaginative imaginative storytelling was there from a very very early age, really. I love that. I love that you could collaborate with your nan and you know make sure she was on point with her stories and she remembered. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> she had to yeah tell them like I liked them or I think do it myself <laughs> I honestly think that's the one of the best gifts you can give children is that love of storytelling you know whether you know it's through books or you know a conversation I just think it really is so good on you Nan <laughs> so talk us through I mean talk us through the beginnings you 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 went to art school to and you were or you were studying teaching but no, I went, to, um, I went to do a pre-BA foundation, which is the pathway to art yeah, um, after A levels, and then um, went on to Hereford College of Art and Design um, to do a design crafts degree, mixed media. Um, <clears throat> didn't want to move that far away from home, was quite a home bird, which will sound silly um, over there. Um, but it was the best course for me. There was just you could sort of feel a bit of magic when you went and looked around and and um, the course leader was terrifying but you also had like a, an instant respect for him mm. um and as it happened it was the perfect place for me and that that's where fairies were born you were encouraged to look back into your childhood and into the things that are deep rooted and the things that make you tick and that's where i started to think about where my love for stories and characters and things had come from yeah. So yeah, um, and one brief whilst I was at college was to create a witty Christmas character, and um, by response I made quite a traditional fairy with a gold skirt and um, bodice and things, and um, it it was a hit really. There was some there was some sort of charm in there, um, and that sort of sparked it all, I suppose. But then I wanted them. I wanted them to be more than pretty fairies, if that makes sense. So I was trying to to push it in a different direction. Yeah, yeah. And it certainly I resonated. I love reading your um, website and the, how you sort of tell a story about there was whispers amongst the campus that fairies had arrived and, <laughs> you know, and then they kind of, yeah, I love that storytelling. It's so beautiful. It just became part of that and the, the course teacher nicknamed me brain there um because i was always in my white coat and goggles in the metal working shop learning how to make different gadgets and contraptions but it was actually a book in that in that hereford college library that i found on victorian gadgetry and invention and it was that that started the sort of inventing um, and it was towards the end of my degree that i started to mishmash the two together yeah and variated inventions became a thing. And I hear that your solo exhibition or your graduate exhibition was a sellout and that's kind of what propelled you into full-time fairy making, yeah? Yeah, def definitely. It was a very successful show, uh, very overwhelming and lovely. Um, 
but um, I, where I grew up, I was the first to go to university. Um, and I was going to university really to get myself a career. And the idea of being a maker at that point didn't seem a feasible option. You know, I, I'd got a place to go and do my um, teacher training after. Um, and so the idea of not doing that was quite daunting. Um, and I also think I thought my mum would be disappointed if I didn't do that and get this career choice. Um, but then my crazy um, teacher, he was called Ed, um, had a chat with my mum at the degree at the degree show and they almost were conspiring against me and sort of saying that it'd be a real shame for me not to give it a go. Yeah. So that, that's Isn't what that happened. Gorgeous? Isn't that gorgeous? She thought you'd you thought you'd disappoint your mum, but in the end she was the advocate for you to actually go forth and, yeah, and be a Yeah, mother. and she was the one that found me somewhere to work when I came back as well, because she used yeah. to clean in a, an electrical appliance shop and the, the the owners um gave me a space in the in the storage in the back there was a house at the back um and yeah the brothers vine they were yeah for the first few years i worked in and amongst the, the bits of vacuum cleaner and all sorts of stuff which is probably where the dust obsession came from <laughs> because to begin with um the vacuum cleaners were sort of dream catchers and things quite a, a lot more frivolous than the um, utility gadgets and wear of today yeah do you do you think of those days as the good old days yes yes in lots of ways but also the hard days the long long hours it freezing cold um and being on my own was very, very i mean i'm back on my own again now but then that was nearly the breaking of fairy making mm. um, had i not um, i think it was about four years I took a leap of faith and moved into a group studio that was just being developed for Radiant Work for Huddersfield. Um, and had I not done that, I don't think I continued because it was getting very lonely. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of makers must feel the same way, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's great, great to make and be in your own space, but sometimes you just do need human connection, don't you? You do, you do, and also... It, the thing that I miss the most now, working all by myself, is just being able to say to somebody, "What do you think of this? Is this is this too daft? Yeah. What do you think, think this or this? You know, just an opinion." Yeah, and I just think that that's really, really valuable. Yeah, I agree. That's why? Because um, social media and Instagram and things are so valuable for makers mm -hmm. because it sort of provides that platform, doesn't it? For yeah, yeah, exactly. And you kind of do. I feel like. I mean, I don't know about you, but like in the beginning and like in you building your following and things like that and I, I follow a few people and I can see they're so genuine authentic and I've read a lot of your posts and you know about the struggles with motherhood and you know hey guys I love this but you know just so you know it's really hard and I love that authenticity and you probably feel like you and I read some of the really supportive comments that came through for you um and I just thought yeah this is nice you know this is the good part of social media this is lovely definitely definitely yeah. and yeah. there's times where you think oh you know, social media feels like a real chore. Um, but then, yeah, there's those really, really important parts of it. Yeah, yeah. We are going to definitely get to, you know, seeing some of your fairies. I've got some great images here. So don't worry, people, we're going to get there. Um, but what I wanted to ask you was the little arm patches that your fairies wear <laughs> and, their, and their goggles, where do they come from? Um, so the arm patches, I think, it wasn't a conscious decision, but Ed the course leader at um, Hereford, always had one of those army jumpers on with the arm patches, always yeah. in different colours. That's all he ever wore. And I think it just must have um, seeped into my consciousness and, um, yeah, took over because, the, the, yeah, they've always really had arm patches. Um, and the goggles, are they've got bigger and bigger over the years, but it was about making them into aviators. So I, will look, I was looking at old-fashioned... Um, flight helmets and flight attire really um, and they've just they've become bigger and bigger <laughs> yeah fantastic well they're gorgeous um and just a few comments here um, Marilyn says agreed with having a group around you not only to inspire but to give support in down times yeah and encourage and Definitely. believe in what you do. yeah absolutely um and Tanya says I'm completely in love with Samantha's fairies and have been for quite some time so lovely to be able to meet her now I have to tell you a funny story I hope you don't mind Tanya but we was Tanya and I were together last night 
And I said, oh, I'm, you know, we're talking to Samantha tomorrow night. I'm really excited. And I look over and Tanya's got these gorgeous, round, awesome glasses <laughs> on. And I was like, are you? I wonder if you and Samantha's seen photos of you. And those <laughs> I think there's a resemblance there. Just so beautiful, both of you. So, Tanya, I hope you don't mind me sharing that, that story, but I think it's gorgeous. <laughs> the bigger, so, the better. Yeah. But I love that it's actually not real, apart from, you know, the patches and obviously there's some influence there. But your influence or your inspiration actually doesn't come from real people. Where does it come from? Um, well, originally, it's, it's really hard to track back, actually, because they're kind of just part of me now and they come out. But um, in the beginning, I looked at bugs. Um, so beetle bottoms made the fat bottomed fairy. Um, and, um, yeah, eyes bug eyes and things like that and actually when I do look back their eyes were further round and um, so even without realizing they've come in a little bit but you yeah. don't know because I'm very lucky that I sell everything really I've barely got anything and um, so you don't necessarily see that all the time you know the tracking of the development and things it's quite yeah. quite simple um, but somebody did mention actually that their husband um, was an optician and that he noticed the wide field of vision that fairies have. Yeah. Well, they got to watch their back, don't they? <laughs> Definitely. And have a good view of the flight path when flying because there's a lot of um, risks out there. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about what the role of fairies are and what their, you know, sort of daily chores are in a minute. But I wanted to ask you also about your love of sort of 18th, 19th century sort of um, well, Victorian era, really, flight, is it called flight craft? <laughs> um, or inventions? Yeah, inventions, inventions. I think there's, I mean, I don't know whether you, you've heard of Heath Robinson and, and his sort of crackpot inventions. I was quite inspired, with, inspired by him when I was at university as well. Um, but it's looking at those inventions now with a modern mindset they seem really funny, really ridiculous because things have moved on so far since that invention was important and life changing. So one of the one of the things that I often mention is um, in one of the books, there's a self tipping hat, which was for when gentlemen did that as a mark of respect and polite, um, yeah. really. Uh, and so the idea that somebody made an automatic version um, that would do that just seems really, really humorous. And it was that humor, I think, that made me want to do that because the, the humor hinges around the fairy. The idea that we're inventing for these fairies is um, is a, is a well, I think it's funny in itself. So I'm forever trying to sort of initiate that chuckle and um, to make people think, oh, yeah, that, that's ridiculous. Um, yeah. And yeah, that, that's what I strive for, really. I love that. I absolutely love that. I was doing a bit of research and I found this invention. I thought you might like it. It's a um, umbrella and it's got like, it looks like magnifying glasses in it. So when it's really, really rainy, you can put it right down over your head and still see. And where you can still see yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing. Definitely. <laughs> it's actually not that ridiculous when you think about it though, is it? No, <laughs> no it, it does work yeah. and, I, and I think that's it. But there are, yeah, there are different levels of ridiculous, aren't they? And that one's yeah. quite practical really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and here's just so people can understand sort of what we're talking about. This is kind of like some of the Victorian era flight craft that, you know, that was sort of, yeah, inventing. Yeah, the these, these sort of images are, are always, were always in my sketchbook, these kind of things. Yeah. yeah. And it's nice that you can always turn to these just to inform designs. And because yeah. with the bigger flying machines and things, I have to do a, a lot of sketching to make them look like they'd really work. Yeah. So I have something like that as a starting point and I just design and design. Yeah, fantastic. I actually do have um, one of your sketchbook images here. Let me just find it. Um, oh. Where did it go? down with your books no nope, I didn't load it but it is a picture of a sketchbook and I was going to ask you a little bit about you know how long it takes you to sort of plan out one of your um, designs and do you spend much time much more time in development mode or making mode making is a real long process um, I was just seeing if I could find it in the book um, it's a really long process so the designs um I'd maybe spend, it depends on the, the, 
the thing that I'm working on, but <clears throat> excuse me, it, it's probably spend a day or two on design. Um, and then the making can take weeks to months, just depending on what it is that I'm making. Um, and I don't tend to work on one thing at a time because there's lots of drying time and development time. So I'll be tinkering with something whilst making something else as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And we're going we're gonna to see a little bit of your process in a minute because you've shared a gorgeous video with us. Um, but I actually wanted to ask you about um, an invention that you made that, that wasn't actually for fairies. It was probably more for videographers and um, it was pretty inventive. And um, I just wanted to show it to people. We, we call it a, a, camera, a fairy dolly or a camera dolly in the filming industry. And you pop this up on your Instagram. <laughs> I was so pleased with myself. I was so, so pleased with myself with that. But then actually the end result wasn't that great, which was a bit disappointing. <laughs> it was so great. You'll have to head to uh, Samantha's Instagram, look for a post that um, highlights these guys here, and you'll see this gorgeous little video of the camera moving backwards and forwards. Um, just so everybody knows, this is what we use in videography. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looks like a bit of a wheelchair um, with a big camera on the front of it there. But, yeah, you know, a little Tonka truck does perfectly well. <laughs> no. The only thing is that when I actually saw that in the shop, um, because it was a treat for my eldest son, I thought, that looks really useful. <laughs> yeah, you can have that. That's fine. <laughs> you were thinking of other things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, if you could invent something to help you get through um, everything that you need to do, what would it be? <laughs> Time travel. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, something to make me go faster. Yeah. 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 Maybe, thought, maybe yeah. myself in robot form would oh, be good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> make more, more. Yeah, yeah. So before, before we meet some of your favourite fairies um, and we show some beautiful images. Shall we um, play a little video that you made to help celebrate your 20th um, making anniversary, which is such a, such a big feat. So let's have, a, let's have a look and then we'll come back and, and you can talk us through some of your favourite fairies. Okay, dope. Twenty years of fairies feels significant because it's not a place that I imagined myself arriving. Hereford was quite an extraordinary course. You didn't have to specialise in the subject. You ended up going on a journey of self-discovery, looking back at things. For, for me, it was my nan telling stories when I was little and her poor memory meaning that she couldn't remember the stories that I liked, so it became collaborative. So I was looking back at that storytelling, therefore thinking about characters, and so fairies came out of that. Very quickly, I was fully invested in fairy making and when I hit upon a book of Victorian gadgetry that was teamed up with the fairies and I sort of amused myself, I think, with the ideas and got enjoyment out of that. But at no point did I imagine that I'd be still making fairies 20 years on. I was going to be a teacher and that was the plan right up until after my degree show. But then my degree show sold out and the feedback and comments were so overwhelming that my college tutor had a chat with my mum and my mum even said, I think you'd be daft not to continue with this. That sort of made me stop and think. My degree show sales went to buy equipment and lots of metal and materials and things that I needed. My mum at the time was cleaning in an electrical appliance shop and they actually offered me the back room rent free for as long as I wanted it. That's where I started working with all the vacuum cleaners waiting for repair. When I first started making the fairies, they had a roughness to them because everything was very new. I like that aesthetic, so now I have to try and remind myself not to be so neat because it was part of it. You get the most fulfilment out of the inventions because they're the new element that's introduced every single time. If I can look at it and feel thoroughly amused, then that's a success for me. When they've got a little bit of additional treasure, it's all the more hard to part with them. It's my perceived value. Anyone else would look at that and just think it's a random cohort of colourful junk. 
The fairy world has evolved quite naturally over the years. I sort of see them coexisting alongside us. There's lots of elements of the fairies that aren't fully formed yet, like where they live, for instance, because I don't see them following fairy tradition. The main thing is about how they live and what they do and how they travel. I can't really go to a museum or see ordinary things without wondering what the fairy alternative might be. The fairies are duty-bound to fulfil fairy service in all its different guises, whether it be collecting dust, whether it be keeping the flight path safe and secure and well lit. Those are the things that have captured my imagination. But there is still a lot of that world that's unexplored and questions that are unanswered. It's not the most conventional of careers and without lovely opportunities I'd not have had the confidence or the means to go forward and make this happen. Grateful for the opportunities that have taken me on the journey and grateful for the love that the work receives mainly because without that I don't know if you would keep making. Cause they're not the easiest things to make, they take a lot of determination. There's been a few points over the years that I have tried to disentangle myself, but there's just so much more that they have to give. That was a beautiful video. Like, well done for getting that produced. That was great. A very clever duo that are lovely. So, yeah, really nice. Yeah. I love how they made the little eyes blink, like, you know, I've watched it a few times now just to see the eyes blinking. <laughs> it's almost like, did they blink? <laughs> Are they watching? You know, like I can remember when you were a kid and you used to think that your teddies were alive and you used to think that, <laughs> you know, they would, you know, when you left the room, they would move. It was kind of like, felt like they captured that essence of it. So, yeah. So you approached, is it RNA and they um, created that for you for your 20th? It did. Well, uh, quite a few years ago, um, they made one um, and it was the first of anything like that I'd done. Um, and it just surpassed all my expectations. It just travelled around the world lots of times um, and really pushed the fairies up to another um, level of, yeah, love, really. Um, and so it seemed, yeah, a good idea to get them to come back because I knew they were lovely and that they do a good job. Um, to celebrate 20 years. Yeah, I love their work. I think I've seen another artist use them before as well and it's just just great. Um, yeah, Cindy, I love that Hoover polishing brush as well. That was so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, magnificent men in their flying machines. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely alive, Sarah, absolutely. Yeah, great video. Well done for investing in that. That is fantastic. So... Fairy dust. So tell us the main um, the main duties of fairies and then I would love to, to show the fairy flyer. Okay. Um, so they've got lots of duties, but the main massive duty is to collect fairy dust and distribute fairy dust and also identify um, fairy dust. And th those particular tasks can take a lot of fairy time and can be very, very time consuming, laborious and all of that. So it's quite a privilege to be able to invent um, vehicles, devices and such like that make that a bit easier for them so that they do get a little bit of leisure time because they're very, very overworked and there was it was becoming quite a crisis in the fairy world. Um, it still is really, but they're doing better now. They've got these devices at least. Mm. Is there a fairy ombudsman? <laughs> Probably. There should Probably. be. I'm not aware of it as yet, but I, if, with a bit of research, I suspect there would be. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, good. I'm glad. Mm. <laughs> there needs to be there's one. A lot, there's a lot of federations. When you start to look into it, there's federations, you know, to keep the flight path safe with speeding and such like. Um, mm. I've just been trying to think about devices for speeding ferries and whether it's a, a good idea. I was thinking that they'd have to have some sort of um, you know, like a, a Victorian roof, but in fairy world, that would really ruin the streamlined um, capabilities of a flight suit. So if you were a prolific speeder and you needed to be slowed down, you'd have to be fitted with this collar and it would be called a drag collar. That's something oh, wow. that I'm tinkering with at the moment in the background. Yes, yes. And so that would go off if you needed to slow down. 
No, no, that would they would have to wear that because they were bad because they were speeding fairies. But I don't know if I'm got ready to go down that route yet. But I like the idea of it. Yes, I've heard of devices in the cars that if you've been caught drink driving, like they make you blow into like a alcohol <laughs> breath device so you can't start your car unless you blow zero. So I'm kind oh. of relating it to that. Mm. Not yeah. that, you know, there shouldn't be any drunk flyers out there, fairy flyers. Well, no, 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 they probably wouldn't drink, but they might occasionally speed um, and, and do that a bit too often. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a balance, isn't there, between bad and... yeah. Yeah, I like naughty. I like naughty, a little cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally resonate with fairy dust and um, it takes me back to nostalgia because when my daughter was uh, young and probably up until she was probably too old for it, who knows, but we would have to make her go to sleep by sprinkling fairy dust all over her bed and it was actually this full ritual and we had to like clap our hands and rub our hands like this and then we had to go like this and like sprinkle fairy dust all over her and she would choose what colour it was as it poof, blew into the air and then we had to tuck her in and do this shake thing. So it was this whole ritual around the fairy dust. So I just loved that you made um, these inventions. So I'm going to have to show them to her <laughs> and say, look, we don't need to do this anymore. Um, the fairies can actually have these planes that do it for them. But she said, yeah. so <laughs> I don't think she wants us to do it anymore. So tell us about this gorgeous fairy flyer. I absolutely love this one, Samantha. Oh, um, so this one hasn't necessarily got a fu function. It's more a, re a reconnaissance vehicle. But um, it. so for um, the exhibition that celebrated 20 years, I was trying to use lots of my treasure that I've collected because despite the fact that I collect it to use, I find it very difficult to use it. And so mm. this is a vintage juggling pin that I actually found when I was teaching in Ballarat um, quite a few years ago and I brought it back in my suitcase and kept it on the treasure shelf and was just really reluctant to to use it because once once they've gone it, it's kind of left my it, because everything sells and so yeah. I have things sometimes where I need a duplicate version of the treasure before I can make it and let it go um, yeah. But there are two juggling pins, so it felt like I should finally give that one life. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. I just loved the fact that it's this reclaimed materials. And what, what's the tail made out of? That's um, It's a piece of brass that's been stamped um, with the number, but um, I use um, like chemical patinas to make them look old. So it started as a really shiny bit of brass and I've gradually... Um, yeah yeah antiqued it yeah it's absolutely gorgeous when did did flight become an integral part of your art practice um very very early on actually i think um when i think back one of the very first exhibitions that i was in was an exhibition called flight um and i made my very first airship um, back then it was very different to how they are now it, it was very wonky and cronky um but um yeah and and so yeah I went to a, a gallery in, in Wales in England and hung that for this exhibition and it and it felt very significant because I'd, I'd literally I think I'd just graduated and um, so it was lovely to have had work accepted yeah yeah absolutely that's gorgeous um, and what about the materials? Like the materials you use, how do they inform your work? Like, you know, does the fairy or the design sort of speak to the materials or, vi or vice versa? Like are you choosing the materials and then the design sort of evolves around that? It varies. It, it varies from piece to piece. Um, it, there will be circumstances where I found this beautiful bit of treasure, like that that hoover brush that became a vehicle and then you're just itching to turn it into something and so you start sketching around that that particular thing but then other times I'll have an idea and it will stay on the back burner until I find the bits that will bring it to life um so yeah sometimes I have to um ha really look for the right thing um, to make mm. an idea come to life um the fairies um like I said now, I used to draw them and um, because all the little subtleties like the distance between the eyes and where the mouth 
footballs, they're all very considered in terms of personality and things, but now they they really just grow out of the table of things. It might just be that I've got a particular helmet that I love or a particular um, set of feathers or that I found a particularly beautiful bit of leather that will make the perfect flight suit. So they do just grow up now out of the materials. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, actually, that, that was one of my questions. Like, would you say they grow out of the materials? Yeah. Yes. They do now, definitely. They do now. Yeah, that's a beautiful place to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a question from Wendy. Thanks so much, Wendy. Um, she asks, you know, when it's question time. So anytime it's question time, guys, so just, just far away. Um, only if you're comfortable, but I'm curious if it cost you thousands to have the video made and how much time did it take for filming? Was it done remotely? No, no, they came, they came to the studio um, for, it was just a day, that one. The, the previous one was a couple of days, but that one was just a day. Um, it, it cost, uh, about, yeah, uh, over a thousand pounds, not three thousand pounds. I can't remember exactly where in that. Um, it varies on the filmmakers um, and um, R and A co collaborations were very, very motivated by telling stories, and that, that was their thing. So they tried to make it as affordable for makers as possible. So very yeah. fortunate. So. Yeah, that's so good. What a great investment. I really do feel that it's a fantastic investment. Yeah. It is. An, it, and, I mean, the first one, I think, was, I don't know what year it was. I think it was 2016. And I'd been making for a long time at that point. And I honestly took for granted that people knew all the things that I put in that film already. But actually, it, it was just remarkable to see how people were like, oh, I've followed you for years, but I didn't know that. I just mm. think it's got the power to to tell a, a bigger story, really. Yeah. And so as much as I hate to see myself on film, and actually the first one was worse, I um, only ever used to watch it on silent. And it took me ages to release the first one as well. And they kept saying, can we release it yet? And I was like, I'm just not sure. Um, yeah. But when it was time, I just said, yeah, just don't show me, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a brave thing to do, to put yourself on film and, you know, to go live on the video. Yeah. I think you just... <laughs> mostly just got to accept that you won't like how it looks or how it sounds but that that's how you sound and that other people yeah. know that already <laughs> yeah and it brings so much joy to other people's lives so you just have to put yourself aside and go you know what this is for others maybe not so, you know more so than it is for me so yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Wendy. And Wendy says thank you for that answer too. Um, Robin asks, uh, where do you find your bits and pieces? Great question. All over. Um, so I suppose now my entire life is just taken over by this. So I have friends that deliver packages of fairy helmets. I had some delivered just outside my door yesterday. Um, so they're collecting them all the time for me. Um, wherever I go, you know, if I see a little odd bit of treasure or something, I would just buy it because I just think, oh, actually, that could be a fairy vehicle or that could be, um, so like a little scoop could be um, a little wheelbarrow to collect helmets. Um, I think I'm just so deeply rooted now in this world that my whole life is sort of spent collecting. So car boots, antique shops, junk shops, charity shops. Um, yeah, but I just need to use a bit of my treasure before yeah um, bye <laughs> yeah absolutely thanks robin um gail i've got your question but i'm just going to show a couple more, oh, one more fairy before we get to that because i do it's a good question I, I will get to it um but first of all smith i just want to show some more of your work because it's just beautiful talk us through the now i'm going to say b a a v blimp <laughs> the bath <laughs> the bath blimp, or the bath blimp. <laughs> yeah tell us about this little guy <laughs> So that is an aerial application vehicle. So Brain's aerial application vehicle. And um, it's basically an industrial um, facility for spreading dust um, in places that, that really need it. Um, so it's got a massive, massive duck sack, dust sack on the back. Yeah. Um, and it's been developed just to make that job really easy in the areas that are dependent particularly on fairy dust. Wow. 
Wow. You must have a, like, I know that you've written a book, but there must be a storybook somewhere in your mind, yeah? Like a, like a full Definitely. Book. I mean, this is just a compilation. It's, um, it's just the best bits and it's nice to have that there. Um, but I have always wanted to do um, storybooks and I've also always wanted to animate them. And yeah. I've worked with different people and different ideas over the past, but it's never been quite the right time. Um, but hopefully... It will get. It needs the right collaboration, really, and the yeah. right scenario. But yeah, the the so a single fairy is a snippet of the story, and they've all got hand typed labels um, on on one of my vintage typewriters, and that's to give you a little bit of an insight of the story. Yes, like so. Um, but I just give a snippet so that there's still room for the the buyer, the collector, the viewer. To, to be involved in the process as well. Yeah, yeah. I love this little guy. Is he helping people land? Yes. Yes. So that's, yeah, um, yeah the, the old-fashioned flag signalling and he's doing a letter, a letter H and he's doing a letter D to say it's like a, a fairy alert system essentially. So if it's danger, they would do a D um, and if somebody oh. needs help, they would do a H or they could spell out other things. So there's a whole, I'd, I like, I'd like the idea of doing the entire alphabet um but obviously it would be quite a time consuming thing but one day i think I'll yeah <laughs> and what about this one resting station i love this <laughs> so uh yeah this this was um the bit of treasure that started this so the the old vintage ruler um made me think about making it into this and it's um yeah it's a tandem resting station because fairies need to take a breather mid-flight or because they've just collected loads of dust and they just need a bit of time to gather gather their energy again um, and so i started um making these sort of swings i suppose you could call them a few years ago and, and, and they're just always um really loved and i think it is just again it's that, that nostalgia and thinking about back to the things that you enjoyed doing as a child. It's quite nice to be reminded of that, isn't it? Give yeah. permission, people permission to, to not fully grow up. Yeah, exactly, exactly right, yeah. Talk us about the essential t ingredients to fairy making. So in terms of tools and equipment, like what can't you live without in that gorgeous studio of yours there? Yes, <laughs> and so I, use my blowtorch for all of the inventions um yep and so it's just brass and copper wire and sheet and i use lots of um hammers and saws and things like that to to, to shape it and then i use this to to solder them together um so that's the metal work um i need a leather needle and some oh yeah all my wire and pliers i need a leather needle and some stitches these are my favourite pliers that I've had since I was at college. So they're very, very old. And I recently thought I'd lost them on a photo shoot and I was gutted, but then they turned up in a pocket that I didn't realise. So that was that was lovely. Um, and then just really simple things like I use loads and loads of cocktail sticks and um, kebab skewers to stuff, stuff the fairy bottoms. Um, I use all sorts of different tools, but those are the things that I just can't live without. And there's a little deconstructed fairy that, that gets very green. lovingly gorgeous. And are they real feathers that you use? They are. They are, um, yeah. Yeah, they're just beautiful. Yeah, so always yeah. looking for feathers as well. And I'm very fortunate. I'm, I'm doing a, a piece so that um, I'm doing a piece at the moment that the lady has sent me the feathers that she's collected over time from her garden and they're, they're my favourite feather. They're um, woodpecker. And so they're um, the ones... I haven't got anything. Oh, I have. Just a second. Oh, these are yeah. um, the woodpecker feathers. And they're, they're my favourites. They're just beautiful, aren't they? And so oh, she'd yeah. managed to collect some over time. This isn't her piece, but um, yeah. that's what I'll be using. The other one's just fallen out. It has got two feathers, honestly. Yeah, wow. Wow. <laughs> they look like they've been painted, you know, the so purposefully. I know, so, they're just yeah. stunning. Um, so it's just finding ways to, to, to get them and I'm forever looking for people that keep different kinds of birds that can that can provide them ethically 
Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. At the minute, I'm, I've found some really beautiful bright ones as well. And so I, I'm going to make a sort of a brighter range of, of, of fairies. Um, but I haven't quite finished the narrative around that quite yet. No. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll have to keep an eye out for some of our parrots. Um, so we live in a beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. with lots of, like, there's parrots everywhere. Um, so I'll keep an eye out in the backyard and if some sort of float down, I'll, I'll see if I can send you a little little package. <laughs> I love yeah, doing that. Yeah. I think this one's just a blackbird. I think he's just a bit, he's nothing special. But um, we do get a lot of really bright, colourful ones, so I'll keep an eye out. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to show people, we've got a bit of a view of your studio here, but, um, you know, what a beautiful, eclectic, gorgeous place. How many typewriters do you have? Well, it was 11, but then one of my best friends bought me another one for my birthday, so it's 12 now. Oh, my well, goodness. And you can um, see... I don't the use all of them. Those are my two favourite ones. The, the grey one is literally one that was found in the skip whilst I was at college in Hereford, um, and it was... Um, the crazy cat, crackpot teacher again that rescued it from the, sh the skip and just put it on my desk oh. um and it's been going strong ever since but it's in a really bad state of repair so i've got all the other ones as sort of backups really because um i just i still like that one the most yeah and i just love that black and white <laughs> photo of you as well you just look so happy and and beautiful so yeah yeah. Oh, yeah. Kookaburra feathers. Yeah, they are gorgeous, the kookaburra feathers too. Yeah. Yeah. I've got one of those. I'm very lucky. So, yes. Um, perfect. Yeah. Your fairies make me smile and happy. That is so beautiful. Um, so one of the common questions artists always ask is kind of, or a problem is like kind of how do you know when a piece of work is finished? Like when do you not like overdo it? So I wanted to ask you, how do you know when a fairy is complete and if it's successful? <laughs> That's a tricky question, actually. Um, I, I, can't, I just feel it now. Um, with the fairies, I, it doesn't take a lot of thought now. Um, but I, so even just so this chap here, who's at the side of me, Avis, he's going to a new home at the weekend. But... Um, I'd finished him I thought and then I came in the next day and looked and he had this lighter pair of goggles on um, like the colour of his braces and there was just something that didn't quite work for me and the night before I felt like it did um, and so I took the goggles off and started again so I suppose really it's time it's giving yourself that time to look and look again um, and to really consider and in my earlier days, when I used to have to work very, very fast to deadlines for exhibitions and things, I would often send things out. And then if I got them back at the end of the exhibition, I'd be like, oh, that still needs a bit more. And so I would still add more or take something off when they came back from exhibition because like, looking at them again with fresh eyes um, made me feel like that was the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and when do you know that they're successful? Um, well, if they make me smile, they're successful. But then, like, um, I don't know about successful. But just just if 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 they work as um if so like the inventions, if they look like they really would work, then that that feels successful to me. Yeah. Um, fairy, it's about scale and personality um, for their success, I think. Successful yeah. is a strange word, I think, but yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, it's, it's quite a strange word. I, I asked that question because I, I read somewhere that, that you said, um, you know, my work's successful when it makes me and others smile, and I just thought, yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. It is very important mm. And I think, um, you know, Tanya said here, awesome, awesomely in, imaginative, smile-inducing, quirky and so joyous. Your fairy make my heart sing every time their flight path crosses mine. To me, that's that's success, yeah. <laughs> that's that's success. But it's, yeah. That, that, yeah, you're right with that, actually. I haven't thought of it like that, but that's exactly what I strive to do. So I'm very pleased that you find that that's the case because, yeah, uplifting, um, removing people from the worries, um, creating a smile, 
those, those are the best feelings. And when, whenever I used to do retail shows um, and people would come past the, the stand, see my work, start to walk past, then do a bit of a back take and start laughing, yeah, that would be, yes, that would be like a real, I've done it, that's, that's the success. Yeah, yeah. I used to I used to have the pleasure of being a, a newborn photographer and a family photographer, and I loved taking photos of children and, and children, um, families. And my definition of success was that if I was showing people their work for the very first time, you know how sometimes when you see an image you go, oh, like that, like you do that little, oh, like to me, if I didn't get that reaction, then I hadn't done my job good enough. Like I, I really, that, that was my, that was my, you know, baseline. I needed that little. Yeah, you that. yeah and I, I didn't matter if they brought or not. It was just like that little take your breath away. So yeah, having a smile or a double take, I think is really beautiful too. Yeah. Samantha, you must have a million ideas running through your head at any one time. And there's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many things you can sell and you've got two beautiful children and a husband and a family and a home. Um, so Gail actually asked like, the question, you know, how do you cope when you have a queue of fairies waiting to be born? It's a great question, Gail. <laughs> yeah, I have a very busy brain um, to the point where it's a bit malfunctioning, a bit malfunctioning at the moment. Um, I uh, used to always have a pad and pen by the bed to catch um any ideas because sometimes that's the, where, where the best ideas arrive don't tend to do that just at the moment because i generally have a baby at the side of me in the bed well it's one um so it's not quite as um idea provoking just now but i'm i would imagine i'll get back to that point again um it's yeah there's just a lot of ideas all the time and i think that's why i'm still doing it because I haven't run out of ideas. It, it yeah. feels like there's still tons and tons to realise. Um, and sometimes you've got to be in the right place energy-wise for some of the ideas because they're actually a lot more complicated. And so you have to, yeah, stack them up for different times. Yes, yeah, keep keep them in the treasure chest and, and just know <laughs> that they'll happen for the when time. And there's, right. there's tons that are still just in... Um, in my sketchbook that are still not being realised or ideas that haven't quite worked out how I would make them yet. You know, you've got a really good idea, but you don't actually know how you would do it. And so it might be that eventually that would come to life because I learn a new skill or something yeah. like that. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you for your question, Gail. I think, it, yeah, it's an important one. So I call it BC, before children. Um, you work mainly on commissions. Um, and so I was wanted to ask, and, you know, maybe you could give some advice to other artists out there about, you know, sort of what are the pros and cons of working um, to commission? Um, and also then how did you transition into how you sell now and, and what that method is? Okay. So, yeah, pre, pre-children. Um, I, well, for a long time, really, fairies were, were everything, really. Because um, I didn't even have a partner for a while, so I, I went out to do retail shows. I did exhibition after exhibition. I was teaching here, there, and everywhere, and life was just crazy all all hours really. Um, and then I met my husband, so I consciously tried to be more mindful about what I said yes to. Um, and yeah, then after children, I had to change it. So I had. Before I had my first born, I had a waiting list that took me for, it was about two years long, um, which was a lovely, lovely place to be in. Um, and I felt very fortunate, but I also felt very, um, stifled sounds like a horrible word, but it did do something to creativity because January I had to make this, February I had to make this everything was set out and it left very little time to realize some of the ideas that was in my head because inevitably commissions people want something similar to what they've seen for that security and, and I completely understand that because it's such a leap of faith to be commissioned um so I found that I felt very bound by those deadlines and the the other thing was um, I was given the, the, the loveliest privilege of working for engagement presents, really big birthdays, um, 
making commemorative pieces that would be left down the family by grandparents to grandchildren and things gorgeous gorgeous commissions but with that came a sort of weight of responsibility to make sure you got it there on time to make sure it really did fit their criteria um and so there was a lot of back and forth and things like that um and i loved it and it and it was great but i just thought i don't know how i'm going to do this when i've got another person to look after um, and so really maternity leave was the first time i'd ever taken away from fairies for anything longer than a couple of weeks holiday and it gave me time to sort of reassess and think about what i needed to do and what what was important and i'd always hoped i'd just built a make and then sell what i'd made um just so that i could have a period of time developing so i took a leap of faith when i'd had um, my little boy and i said right i'm closing my waiting list which was terrifying and i'm saying no to all my school work because i've often gone into schools and worked on lovely narrative projects which i love but i just couldn't see how i could do that um and but pretty much all of my teaching closed it all down and then said i'm just going to release um a, a group of fairies every two months from now on and keep it much more simple give myself a period of time to develop the ideas that have been tapping away like a woodpecker um but also whilst my brain's tired and my brain's busy it sort of simplifies make a life if what makes sense um mm. and so i've been doing that ever since 2019 when i had my first little boy and it's been really good it's been yeah, every time I do a release, I have to pinch myself because they sell so quickly and they go to such lovely, lovely people and I just feel very, very lucky. Yeah, yeah. And what a leap of faith to sort of, and be brave, so brave. You know, it's brave, brave enough being an artist and putting yourself out there in the first place, but then to go, you know, well, I'm going to sell on my terms and this is how it needs to be. And I think that's, that's <laughs> work. yeah. And congratulations. I mean, the model works for you and, um, we spoke on Wednesday night that if you are looking to to purchase one of Samantha's beautiful fairies, you must head on to her website, sign up for her newsletter, and then you email people when there's the release happening. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So it's become a bit of an informal waiting list. Um, and, yeah, so you get an email maybe a week before they were going to be released, and then the the night of the release, it's usually at 8, eight o'clock, um, at my time so that it's better for, for worldwide purchasing um, then you get a little reminder to say head over to the shop and, and it is just it is crazy they literally go in the shop and they're gone within minutes and I, just, I still can't believe it and I'll never take it for granted and every time it happens I'm just grateful and hope it continues for a bit longer yeah I hope so too you know enjoy it you, you you've definitely definitely earned it yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to mention to you and, and maybe others out there, I know our audience is probably, you know, um, maybe don't have little, little ones at home, but there is a, I recently came across a book and it was through our friends at Fibre Art Now and it was called, it's called The Motherhood, the, uh, sorry, The Motherhood of Art. And it's by um, Melissa Huber and Heather Kirtland. And it's a series of interviews that they've done with a whole heap of makers who are juggling motherhood, little kids and, and making. Um, and so it's designed to sort of pick up, have a quick read if you've got five minutes or actually just to devour it all at once. But it kind of, you know, gives people a lot of support and um, just you know, letting people know that, yeah, this is a really, really valid way to spend your time and you're not neglecting your kids and keep going sort of thing. <laughs> I need you to send me that afterwards if that's okay. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. To. Yeah. Well, actually, I wanted to gift you a copy of it because I just thought, you know what, you just need to pick it up every now and then when you've this <laughs> and go you know what keep fairy making this is worth it um and i'll just pop a little link up here for people um as well and i want to talk about before i know we've been going for almost an hour samantha but if you don't mind can you tell us about your book and how you created it and and i'll pop a link up to where people can also purchase that one yeah i'll shuffle this to the side a little bit because i've got it here oh, yeah. so that you can that you can see um, so I've always wanted to put fairies into, I'll do a little 
flick through just so that you can see. Um, oh, gorgeous. Um, I've always wanted to put them together um, because I don't think it's very rare that there's an opportunity to see fairy with the story captions and lots of them. Um, and this gives a really good overview of that, but also it's my best bits over the 20 years. So in the middle of the book, there's an archive that's got every year and the different things that I've done. Um, so like the first year that I graduated and when I did a big um, commission for um, a health centre. So I don't know if you can see me oh, wow. there with my lovely you. blimp. Yes. Younger me. Um, I love that. So it's got every year in the middle up until up until now. And it it just gives a real oversight of of my career today and how it how it's differed and and yeah, lots of really big pictures of fairies and how they're made. And, that, and and I wanted to do that to commemorate 20 years. I wanted to do something um that sort of yeah was was there solid and wouldn't leave. And then I've also got it. It's it's a bit like a photo album, essentially, isn't it? Of, of, of lovely things. Um, and I was very lucky that um, Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which is about 20 minutes from me, I've had quite um, a lot of exhibitions and things with them over the years. And I asked them if they would be interested in um, launching it for me and was offered a, a showcase to accompany it. So that was, I had to, unfortunately, I had to come um, back to work for a bit a bit earlier than I would have done with my second little boy, which felt a bit of a wrench. And, and I can't, um, I definitely wasn't sane throughout that period. I felt like my marble falling out all over the place. But with a lot of help from my husband and my family and my friends, we did it. But also the other thing was that it was all, well, not all because I had to put a lot of money towards, but it was paid for with a Kickstarter funding. Yeah, uh, how was that? Which was just really lovely and again oh I, so i'd not been working and i launched this kickstarter and i don't think i've ever been so nervous in my entire life when i did that it was so so scary but it it worked <laughs> yeah absolutely and i i saw this on your instagram these little badges that you created as part of that campaign so how did, how did that sort of tie in and so these were um uh, as part of the pledges you give so there were different tiers um and this was one of the smaller tiers so people could pledge i think it was 10 pounds and they would get a badge um and that goes into the pot then to pay for the the book um publication and printing and such like but mm -hmm. actually through doing those little badges they were so well received that um i'm actually going to design two a year um like little limited because they were limited editions of a hundred and yeah. so the next two which i haven't told anyone about yet are going to be Bert and blanche and hopefully they'll be released later on in the year these little badges because i like the idea of people oh. that the people that can afford to invest in fairies um there's not tons and tons of people I wouldn't be able to invest in a fairy. Then they're, they're not they're not cheap. They're not cheap because they take so long. Um, so it's just keeping keeping people, giving people the opportunity to be involved and feel yeah. part of it because it's yeah. become a bit of a community, really. Yeah. Does that yeah. Make sense? I've just rambled about them. <laughs> No, it, it makes perfect sense and it's kind of half the reason why we do the Friday Feature Artists as well is because we want to give access to, to you, great artists, you know, from around the world that may not necessarily be able to, one, afford to go to live workshops or to even do online courses as well because, you know, we don't proclaim to be cheap either um, because, you know, you want to offer a quality service and things but you also want to be accessible to people yeah, around the world. That's it, yeah. is the perfect mm -hmm. word and that was part of the, the thinking yeah. with the book as well, something yeah. that people have whether they can um invest in fairies or not and also it's not just investing is it it's been in the right place at the right time to get one so yeah, yeah. it's made it accessible yeah fantastic we just had a question Jeannie marie asked are the heads made of clay they are yeah. i've got a little um a bald one there can you see <laughs> so, he looks so that he's head. Head. yeah yeah do you have to fire them in the kiln or are they air dry yeah, they're just air dry clay. I did tinker with the, the whole ceramics process at 
um, university, but it was just, an, I've got so much, t like in terms of welders and blow torches, it was another bit of machinery and that does the job just fine, I think. So yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Fine. Fantastic. So um, a comment here from Wendy, I can imagine super oversized ones hanging in hospital or bank foyers like Karen Rossi's work. Have you ever considered large ones? In Australia, sculpture competitions attract 20, 30, up to 50K in prize money. I'm going to be a sculptor. <laughs> and really, <laughs> they are sculptures of sorts. Of course they are. Yeah, Wendy. So tell them over there. Yeah. yeah. I have done a few larger scale ones. Um, and then I think I just, at that point, I, I didn't want to continue with that. I found it took away some of the essence of what I was doing. I'm not saying never again, though. I, I think now more than then, I would like the idea of installations of them en masse or as part of a, a bigger installation rather than blowing them up big. Yeah, a fairy convention. Yeah, there needs to be a world. Like rush hour. Yeah. Rush hour in fairy world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I love that idea. <laughs> Samantha, we've, we've been going over an hour and it's just been a joy talking to you. And, you know, thank you, everybody, for your kind comments um, and sharing the love back to Samantha. Um, certainly people are loving those badges. So, yeah, what a great way to make your work accessible to, you know, to us mere mortals. But it's beautiful. And, you know, if, if people have them at home, good on you as well. I think that's brilliant. So, um definitely but so um everyone that's watching please pop your thank yous and comments into the um chat section to thank samantha we'll play a little credit and get everyone's names up at the end but before we go samantha i wanted to ask you if you could go back 20 years and give your give yourself some advice for the future what what would that be Oh, do you know, normally I'd be able to answer this really easy, but easily, but my brain. Um, I would go back and I would say it's okay to say no to things. Um, the world won't fall in if you say no. And I would also go back and tell myself to be um, more confident, I think. Um, even so far as like buying um, tools and equipment, I always just felt like a little a little girl back then who was inconveniencing people. I'd just like to go back and give myself some of my now personality, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, thank you so, so, so much. And um, someone, Sarah, has just said, lovely to see your face again and thanks for summoning up the courage to go live. <laughs> You know what, Sarah, it is even like I do this a lot and I, I honestly have to sum up the courage every time. So, Samantha, to do it for your very first time, like, well done. I'm going to go and eat a big bar of chocolate now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hang on the end of the line. I'll just play a showreel um, to see us out and put some beautiful comments up. And thanks once again, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thanks, Sarah.